Okay. Good morning to you. Nice to see all of you. Good morning. So um, I hope we are, your Purim was nice. It was very fun here, very different. Um, so it's one of it's the only holiday where people in Israel do different things depending on where they live. So um, Purim, if you live in Jerusalem or in a city that was walled at the time of Joshua's entering into the land of Israel, then Purim is celebrated the following day, which is why I couldn't teach last week because last Wednesday was actually Purim for Jerusalemites. And it was Tuesday for the rest of the country and the rest of the Jewish world. So we kind of did a combination thing. We went out to our kids on Tuesday for their Purim meal. And then we came back in time to hear the Megillah Tuesday night and then on Wednesday morning and then Wednesday and people were out adults dressed up in costumes and just this is just like a little snippet because basically everybody's doing Purim anybody who's Jewish is doing Purim walked by somebody who was sitting at the bus stop just kind of like nondescript person and she asked the other person not a not a question you would hear at a bus stop in any place else until what time can you hear the Megillah on Wednesday morning. I'm like, and I was excited because I understood it was in Hebrew. I'm like, nobody asked that question. So it was like, I like, it was so wonderful just to see everything. And then as I said in my email, the day after Purim, everything turns into Pesach. And it is cleaning supplies, rags, cleaning fluid, foil, tape, tablecloths, Seder plates, like everything that you would need to make Seder, that's everything is all piled up and everything having to do with Purim is completely gone. Um, now it's all in everybody's houses trying to figure out who's going to eat all of that candy and, uh, you know, nosh between now and when Pesach starts. So who knows? But it was very fun. It was very fun to have. So let us start. Um, we'll start with our blessing and then we will launch right into our class. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah And I want to give a special welcome. I see that one of my mentors, uh, Rachel Trugman, has signed on. So Rachel, welcome. Thank you so much. It's so nice to see you and to see all of you. So welcome. Um, so happy to be able to do this. And as we saw that the theme for today is wine, women, and wisdom. This week's Parsha is a double Parsha, Vayakhel and Pekude. And with these two Parshas, we will conclude the book of Exodus, the book of Shemot. And we will conclude also the description of the building of the Mishkan. So the building of the Mishkan is now going to be complete. And then it will be in progress, but this is the end of the description of it. And in addition to that, this Shabbat is called Shabbat HaChodesh, which is the Shabbos of, that comes right before Rosh Chodesh Nisan, which tells you that Passover is really coming, the beginning of Nisan. And since we're ending the book of Shemot, it's also called Shabbat Chazak, because we will say Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazak, Strength, strength, and let us strengthen one another. Let us be strengthened. And it will also be the announcement of Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So all of that is going to converge this Shabbos. So there is a lot going on. And woven in all of this, we have a combination of getting ready for Pesach, concluding the book of Exodus, concluding the Mishkan. And what I want to focus on is based on teachings from Rabbi Moshe Wolfson and also from my teacher, Rabbi Sanshira Smiles, whose classes I've had the privilege of going to uh, while we've been in Jerusalem. So we're talking about today, wine, women, and wisdom. So if it wasn't 11 o'clock in the morning, I would have said, grab yourself a glass of wine. You're welcome to anyway, if you'd like um, to have a glass of wine, because we're gonna talk about the meaning of wine uh, specifically having to do with the Seder, but as we know, everything that we learn in our holidays is not just for the holiday, it's meant to inspire us year round, every day of our lives and not just at the holiday time. But before we do that, we're going to set the stage with a conversation about wisdom and women. 
So it's wine, women, and wisdom, and all of it goes together. In this week's Parsha, it is so filled with women. If you have uh, Chumash available, we're in Parsha's Vayakhel on page 519 in the um, Stone Chumash, otherwise known as chapter 35, verse 22 of the book of Shemot. And it says, the man came with the women. One of my favorite um, verses in the Torah here. And it says, Vayavo hanashim al hanashim. The men came on the women. And it means on the heels of the women, the women were leading. They were the ones who were the enthusiastic people who were donating their time, their effort, their resources to the building of the Mishkan. And the men followed them. So... You might have in your life a situation where you are the lead, the spiritual leader in your family. Um, not every family is like that. Sometimes it's the husband's the leader, but it says the women tended to be the spiritual leaders. They were the spiritual leaders and the men came with them. It continues on. If you go down to verse 25, it says every wise hearted woman spun with her hands and they brought the spun yarn of turquoise, purple, and scarlet wool, and the linen. Now imagine doing this. I'm not a weaver. I used to make pot holders. That was as close as I ever got to any kind of weaving um, in you know, arts and crafts for Girl Scouts, and that was it. But weaving, if you can imagine how wonderful it was to be able to be one of the weavers of the fabrics and the tapestries for the Mishkan. And those beautiful colors, all my favorite colors. And it says the wise hearted women were the ones who did that. It says, what was that? So as I mentioned in the video, it says the women were the weavers. To be able to weave means to be able to bring things together and create a beautiful tapestry, a beautiful fabric, whether it's different colors, different textures, different lengths, different designs, to be able to make something out of just like a heap of different strands of thread, strands of yarn that the, or whatever the fabric was that they were able to do. It says the women, it says the women have the gift of the spindle, that they're the ones who are able to weave things together and see how it all fits together. It says that this is considered the, the spiritual gift of a woman is to see how things fit together and how they can be woven together. And this is the source of the wisdom of the women. In well, addition Ellen? to that, Yes. Can I ask a question? Of I, course. I thought that that um, linen and wool doesn't go to, we can't, we can't wear it or men can't, who, or what nobody, is it? Nobody can wear it, but in the Mishkan, it can be put together. Ah. But, but, okay. uh, but, but you can't. So, because there's nothing inherently wrong with it. So even on a talit, you can have a, a linen talit and you can have wool threads on it. So that's, there are things that are exceptions to it. But yes, a regular garment for a man or a woman cannot be woven together of wool and linen. Yes, good question. Thank you. So they, they did this, but then look at the next where it says, verse 26, all the women whose hearts inspired them with wisdom spun the goat hair. Now, I don't know when the last time was that you petted a goat. A goat tried to eat my skirt at the petting um, zoo in uh, the Bellevue Park. My granddaughter thought that was hilarious as it was trying to eat my skirt. But goat hair is the least desirable of strands. They're short, they're coarse, and that's not really something you would say, oh, I really want to be the weaver of goat hair. However, our sages teach that the women who were really the wise-hearted women, they were the ones who did the goat hair. Now, the goat hair was made into covers for the Mishkan. The Mishkan, the portable sanctuary in the Midbar, was portable, and it was more tent-like. It had wooden planks, but the covers were, were fabric and skins, but it, was, it had fabric and it had goat hair covering everything. This goat hair, I can't imagine. What it, was. it sounds so unappealing. Anyway, the women who were really wise were the ones who, who wove that. Yes, Etta. <clears throat> a certain kind of goat hair is cashmere. Oh, it's okay. It's very appealing. I'm not that's, saying that's what they had, but it, there, they, it, it, it was not. Yes, it was not that. But that's, yes, cashmere is lovely. I happen to be a big fan. Um, so, but these were not cashmere. These were coarse. And it says it was very hard to do. And there's a fabulous midrash 
first of all, it says you have to be a wise hearted woman to be the one who wants to focus on that, to do the work that doesn't seem like it's so um, special on the outside. Yes, Valerie. Wasn't the high priest, it seems to me that the high priest uh, breastplate is made of linen and wool together. So I'm not an expert on that. That may be, yes. Um, and as we just said, there are things that within the Mishkan, within the temple, is an exception to the rule of what ordinary clothing is. So it's just okay. you and me walking down the street, we cannot wear linen and wool together, man, woman, or child. So okay, we don't is, it, is it woven together or wearing together? Because I wear linen skirts and I have wool socks, so that's not right. No, that's fine. No, that's not one, it's that's in the same garment. If you- okay. Yeah, if you took the threads out of your socks and wove them into your skirt, you'd have a problem. You probably okay. have a fashion problem as well, but you definitely have a halacha problem. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the women who did this, so first of all, wanting to be the person who is dealing with something that on the surface looks so unattractive, so that already takes wisdom. Because most of us are attracted to the fun jobs, you know, as they say for an organization, nobody wants to donate money to pay for toilet paper in all the bathrooms, you know, you want to say like, no, I want, I want to pay for something that is that has like a little bit more glamour and glitz and glory to it. I'm like, ugh, that. So to be involved with the goat hair is already saying like, I have a deeper understanding of the overall holiness of the whole thing. And if the whole thing is holy, that means every single part of it is holy. And it doesn't matter if it's goat hair or gold, they're all the same. A person who has that perspective is a person who has the proper perspective towards life as we know it. So there is a beautiful midrash that talks about the women. It says that they wove the goat hair while it was still on the goats. Now I wouldn't really try that at home either. So they. They wove it while it was still on the goats and that they put in such devotion that as they were doing it, they would make a statement like this is for the Mishkan, this is for, you know, this is for the holiness that they had such awareness of what they were doing that the fabrics that the women made said stayed with the Mishkan even after it came into the land of Israel. When the Mishkan came into the land of Israel, who's been to Shiloh and has seen if anyone has been to Shiloh, so the yes, once have. it so once it was put in once it was um, in Shiloh, then it was made out of stone, and it was not it was not portable. They, it was then it was solid, and the truth is there was absolutely no reason for them to be using any of the fabrics that the women had woven, except for the fact that they did. So this is just so so fabulous. It said. Um, this is from Rob, Rabbi Wolfson's um, book. While the Mishkan in the wilderness was a portable structure, the Mishkan the Jewish people erected in Shiloh was permanent. However, the coverings were not put aside. They were used for the Mishkan and Shiloh as well because the women whose hearts were inspired with wisdom had infused them with such kedusha, with such holiness that they added to the holiness of the Mishkan even though they were not needed says that what the women contributed it says like we're keeping those even though we don't need them we need the holiness of the jewish women and that's going to be used in the mishkan even though it wasn't practically necessary at all so so the women infused in infused enthusiasm commitment focus and spiritual clarity into the weaving of these fabrics that were used for the mishkan so much so that it that it also tells us that the kavana, the intention that we put into whatever we are doing becomes part of what we're doing. Because they could have said, you know, like I went through my house before we moved to Israel, I was like, we don't need this anymore. You don't need it. It's like, we didn't need it, but we did need the Kedusha. We did need the holiness that the women brought. So that was one thing. The second is that is also in this week's Parsha has to do with the, the labor. The, the basin that was used that the Kohanim washed in. And that is on page 527, 527. And that is um, verse eight. He, meaning Moshe, or I'm sorry, whoever it was, Bezalo, made the laver of copper and its base of copper from the mirrors of the legions who masked at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Now, the word is very interesting there. And that is the word, the legions. And that is in verse chet in the Hebrew. 
Vayas et hakior nechoshet et kano nechoshet b'marot. Hats. The word is there. Hats. Asliya, what verse are you on? Your chapter on five, verse, right? Uh, we are in chapter thirty-eight, verse eight, page okay, five hundred and twenty. Page five hundred and twenty-seven in the Chumash, chapter thirty-eight, verse eight. And verse eight says he made the laver of copper from the mirrors of the legions and the mirrors of the legions that's that's word is an army word like the sahel that's like sava the army says the army of women so it's like what does that mean and that they massed like an army at moshe's tent they came Excuse to the tent me, are we, i'm sorry to interrupt but i'm just completely lost are we in okay. exodus we are in exodus chapter 38 verse eight okay now i get it thank you okay thank you so they were talking about that the women that the words are used that they were like an army so it's like what does that mean not like that they were it says that they massed but that's not the word the word is like that they armied kind of like if they came to attention and they came to the tent of meeting because their desire to seek the word of hashem to seek torah and wisdom, spiritual wisdom and inspiration was so great. It was just like one woman who came and just, you know, like the people who were really into it. This is like the Jewish women all came, like you, like us. Like here we are. It's like we want to learn Torah. We want to be inspired. We want to have this wisdom to lead us in our lives. It says, and those mirrors that the women had were made into the key or they were made into the basin. The basin is the only thing in the Mishkan that has no measurement to it. Everything else, it had to be like two and a half cubits by one, whatever it is. The key or, God said, what all the women donate, you use every single thing of what the women donate because it's from the women. Okay, so when we read these parshas of Vayakel and Pekude, we see is like the women's enthusiasm, their commitment, their they're the, the ones who are the leaders, their focus, their spiritual clarity. It just comes shining through these parshas. And this is what the Mishkan is all about, is what the people brought, but specifically what, of course, we're trying to understand and appreciate is what the women brought. Now, the best thing about this is that this is not just about the past tense. This is Jewish women have always brought this to the Jewish people and to their communities, and to their families, and to their organizations, and their synagogues, whatever it might be, this is what we bring to whatever we are involved with, is this, this kind of clarity, and this kind of spiritual enthusiasm and excitement. So this is amazing, and it's going to dovetail with this kind of heart of wisdom. So now we're going to back up, we've got the women, and now we want to learn about the wine. Where does the wine fit in? And that's going to take us to Pesach. Okay, so Pesach, as we said, we're getting ready for that. We're going to announce the new month of Nisan, Shabbat HaChodesh. This is the month. Now, remember, in the Talmud, it says, in the merit of the righteous Jewish women, the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt. And in the future, our future redemption will be predicated on the same thing, on the merit of the Jewish women. What is the merit of the Jewish women? These parshas have already told us what the merit is of the Jewish women, and our Passover Seder celebrates it as well. So these were just so such exciting ideas to me, and I want to share them with you. So this comes, and I have the sources, so this sounds funny. I'm going to ask you not to ask me what the source is now during the class, because I have it on Hebrew notes that I can't access quickly, but if you want to stay, and I, I wish I could stay after, but we have a commitment, so I can only stay for a short time, but I have all the sources. If anybody's interested, you can write to me and I'll be happy to share it with you. Everyone's familiar with, I'm sure, some of the basics of the Seder. People may have all sorts of various variations of what they do, but most people's Seders feature matzah, maror, and four cups of wine, right? Four cups of wine. So why do we have wine at the Seder? Why do we have wine? So then there are a number of different answers. And why do we have four? So we're going to start with, uh, and there is a custom also, there's a custom that the wine that we drink at our Seder should be red, okay? 
So never mind your white tablecloth, your white carpeting, or whatever you might have. It is traditional to have red wine at the Seder for the four cups of wine. And the question is why? So we're going to back up and look at what Pesach is celebrating. Is Pesach is our national day. It says Zman Cheirutenu. It is the time of our freedom but it's also called the birth of the Jewish people, the birth of the nation. We became a people at Seder. That's what that, was, that was the launching of us as a people. But it's not just our birth as a nation, it's also our birth as individuals. So the month of Nisan, which is the first month of the Hebrew year, this is a time of rebirth. The entire Jewish calendar and its whole craziness is all factored in to make Pesach be in the springtime in Israel where it's a time of renewal and rebirth. So for being reborn, we have to say, so like, what does that look like? How am I going to be reborn? So the Passover Seder is a symbol of that and it breaks down in an interesting way. In the creation of a human being, we're taught that there are three partners to every person, the mother, the father, and Hashem and God. It's like, okay, and we know biologically what's contributed by each, chromosomally, genetically, et cetera, but spiritually, this is how it breaks down. What we're taught is it says that the father contributes the white part, and I don't mean racial, the white part of the body, such as the bones, the, that structure, the bones that are kind of white. Now you say my bones aren't white, they're red. Go with me here. The white bones are white and it's the structure, it's the hard part, like that allows you to stand up. The mother contributes the red part. It says what's red? It says the red is like the blood and it represents passion, enthusiasm, joy, and happiness. It says that's what the mother contributes. So you can't have one without the other. You have joy and happiness with no structure, you have a disaster. You have structure with no joy or happiness, you also have a disaster. It says when we have our Seder, we have two things that mirror those pieces for us. What's the white? It says the white is the matzah. The matzah is hard. You know, it's the structure, it is the first thing, and we have the matzah at the beginning of the Seder, and we eat the matzah, that's the white part, that's the masculine part. And how many pizza, how many matzahs do we have, like on your, your matzah holder, unlike your challah covered for challah during the year? Very good, Carol. It has three sections in it. And who are those three sections for? A lot of different threes, but primarily, the patriarchs, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, it says the three fathers are the three matzahs. And then we have the four cups of wine. The four says in the wine, the red wine is are the mothers. The four cups of wine are the mothers. And the mothers are Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And it's not just general. The first cup of wine that we make Kiddush over is Sarah's cup of wine. The second cup of wine, which we have at the end of what's called Magi, the telling of the story of the Exodus, that belongs to Rivka. The one that we drink with Birkat Hamazon, the grace after meals part of the Seder, that is Rachel's. And Leah's is the one that is drunk with Hallel, with the final praise. And how do we do this? It says the wine is drunk, not like the matzah. The matzah you have, I mean, you can eat more matzah. You have your matzah and then it's done. The wine is punctuated throughout the Seder. Why? Why is it? It says it's because it's the nature of what the wine symbolizes of joy, enthusiasm, excitement, says we have to be alert to the fact that we need to pay attention to inserting enthusiasm, making sure that we're enthusiastic from beginning to end. It's very easy to be enthusiastic at the beginning of a project. It's very, it's very easy to be enthusiastic when something first starts. It's another thing to be enthusiastic as you're working your way through the process. 
until you get all the way to the end. So it's the enthusiasm and joy that we insert that into the Seder because the nature of wine, unlike the nature of eating matzah. Now, I actually have to be a big fan of matzah. I like how it tastes. But I don't think I would want to be consuming a great deal of matzah throughout the entire Seder because uh, being the economist, there is what's called diminishing marginal returns, which means the first piece tastes great, the second piece not quite as good, the third piece I'm getting tired of it, the fourth piece I'm done. It says wine is different. Wine, which is why people get drunk. People get drunk on matzah, they get drunk on wine. The first glass sounds good, I'm kind of relaxed. The second one like, oh, this is really great. It says that wine, if you can tolerate it, and that's healthy for you, the joy increases. And so it has an expansive aspect to it that talks about the joy increasing as it should during our Seder. Since the Seder, the Pesach is a night, is a love fest between us and God. Thank you for saving us for the exodus from Egypt. We're having a love fest and wine and joy go hand in hand. The Jewish people are not the first people who ever discovered that. That's people know that. So the idea of having that wine come through says it's like the mothers that Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah are coming throughout the Seder to infuse their joy and to trigger our joy and enthusiasm. And it's the role if you are hosting a Seder, if you're going to a Seder and as a woman, like what should you do besides bring one of the, you know, side dishes is our job is to inject the joy. Like this is so wonderful. And it's not just like, oh, the brisket is amazing. It's like, this is the Seder where we're free. This is amazing to say something that infuses joy about Jewish life. That's not like the, you know, like, ugh, you know, there's a lot of whining around Pesach time. You know, everybody's like already starting to whine, ugh, you know, the cleaning, ugh, the whatever. It's like, that is the antithesis of what a Jewish woman is supposed to be doing. We are the enthusiasts here. We're the wine. So maybe you need to uh, drink a wine as you're getting ready for Pesach and give yourself a little chayim, encourage yourself and uh, to put the enthusiasm. Drink into wine it. while you're cleaning. So, absolutely. You can have <laughs> wine while you're cleaning. Nothing says you can't. A bottle a it, day. Uh, that's right. It, you know, um, the, to, because the process needs to be infused with joy. So the women... Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah are woven throughout the entire Seder, talking about a, a, an expansive aspect of joy and enthusiasm to remind us that that's what we want to bring to it. So we learn about this in a very interesting way. Our sages say that one of the reasons we drink four cups of wine is because in the story of Joseph, Remember, he interprets the dream before he interprets the dream of Pharaoh. He's in prison and he interprets the dream of the baker and the wine steward. Okay, so you can find that. Let's take a look at it. Um, if you have the, the stone chumash, it's on page 219. And I'll give you the chapter and verse for those who don't. Um, page 219, verses 9 through 13. Can you tell us the chapter, please? I am just one moment. Um, okay. It is chapter 40 of Genesis. Chapter 40 of Genesis. And we're going to be looking at verse 9 through 13. This is the this is the cupbearer's dream that he is telling to Joseph. Listen to his dream, and you've never listened to it in this way. So our sages say the reason we drink four cups of wine is because the word cup appears four times when Joseph is interpreting this dream. It's like, okay, well, first of all, that seems like such a long stretch. What does the cupbearer's dream have anything to do with my Passover Seder and four cups of wine? Like, what does that, even, what does that have anything to do with anything? But let's listen to the cupbearer. So verse nine, then the Chamberlain of the cupbearer recounted his dream to Joseph and said to him, I want you to listen for what is the what you might notice in the like the the tone or the personality or the something about the cupbearer that lets us know something about him and how he sees his job in my dream behold there was a grapevine in front of me 
on the grapevine were three tendrils and it was as though it budded. The, its blossoms bloomed and its clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes, pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and I placed the cup on Pharaoh's palm. Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three tendrils are three days. In another three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and will restore you to your post. And you will place Pharaoh's time number four cup in his hand, as was the former practice when you were his cupbearer. Says, how did the cupbearer describe his dream of how he saw himself? So in case you're not a dream analyst, which I certainly am not, so I'll just share what our sages teach about this. Listen to the commitment, the loyalty, and the enthusiasm for what he was doing and what he wanted to be doing. Because dreams reveal kind of like our darkest, our deepest inner selves. There was a grapevine before me and it was blossoming and it ripened and the Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I, I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and I placed the cup on Pharaoh's palm. I'm engaged, I'm active, I'm enthusiastic. I, I am a cupbearer. I am devoted to Pharaoh. I am devoted to the king. Joseph hears this. He goes, you're going to be restored to your position. As opposed to the bread person. So let's, when he goes to the next one, and you can see it in contrast. So if you go to the next page or to verse 16, listen to how it's different. The chamberlain of the baker saw that he had interpreted well. So he said to Joseph, I too, in my dream, Behold, three wicker baskets were on my hand, on my head, and in the uppermost basket were all kinds of Pharaoh's food, baker's handiwork, and the birds were eating them from the basket above my head. Okay, pretty passive. It's like, you know, the basket's on my head, and the birds are eating from it. My hands didn't touch it. I don't have anything to do with Pharaoh. I'm just like, I'm not really in this picture. Joseph says to him, <laughs> The birds are going to be eating from your head, that you're, you will not be restored. So now, first of all, we know that Hashem, God gave Joseph the interpretation. But the question is, what do we learn from it? In order for us to say the reason we have four cups of wine is because of the times cup is mentioned by the wine steward. It's like, okay, that seems a little distant. But if we say it's not just that it was mentioned, we're looking at the enthusiasm with which the cup steward wanted, the wine steward wanted to be restored to his position of serving the king. It says, what are we doing on Seder night? What are we asking Hashem? What are we saying? We say, we want to be your people. We want to serve you. And it's not like, okay, fine, we'll do whatever you say. It's like, no, that's the bread person. We're not going to get very far with that. It's like, no, I want to serve and I want to be the best Evet Hashem, the best servant of Hashem that I can possibly be. That's why we do it. So, so that the, the wine steward that he emulated, he models for us this enthusiasm, which is the enthusiasm of the Jewish woman. Now, in this case, the wine steward was not a woman, but it becomes another parallel to show that what we're looking for is enthusiasm, commitment, loyalty, excitement about wanting to be restored to our position. It says, this is Pesach night. At the end of Seder, at the end of Seder, for people who are still kind of focusing on whatever, many people recite Shir HaShirim, a song of songs, which is a love poem between the Jewish people and God, because this is a night of love. It says, and if we miss that point, we kind of miss the whole idea. And in whose hands is it given? It says, it's the women's enthusiasm. Yes, you're going to have the matzah. No problem with that. The matzah is the structure. The matzah, interestingly, is it's called Doraisa. It is a mitzvah in the Torah. It says you have to have matzah and maror. That's the commandment. Wine is not in there as a command. It's like, oh, how do we get that then? It says you can't command somebody to be enthusiastic. I want you to be enthusiastic. Okay, I know like, you know, coaches try to do that. Be enthusiastic, be committed, be excited. It's like, either I am or I'm not. So 
It can't be commanded. I can tell you, do this or do that of an action, but I cannot command you on how you're going to feel when you do it. I cannot command you what expression should be on your face and what tone should be in your voice and whether you're going to be schlepping around or whether you're going to be like have a bounce in your step. I can't do that. So that is a choice that we make and that's going to actually make or break our Seder. That will define it. And the, everything else is, is structural and is required, but it's necessary, but not sufficient. Necessary, but not sufficient. So you can't have a Seder and say, you know, we're just going to have the enthusiasm part. We're not going to have the matzah. No go. We're just going to have the matzah. We're not going to have the enthusiasm. No go. And I have to say, I having lived as long as I have, and maybe you have too, people have a hard time sticking with the Seder. First of all, it's late. People like after dinner, people are like done. You know, can we just rush through the rest of this and be done? It's like, have you ever seen the bride or groom say, can we just be done with this wedding already? It's like, I'm done. Like, I would be worried about the relationship if, you know, the bride said, you know, I'm like kind of done with this. Usually the bride and groom are like, oh, it's over already? The wedding's over already? Like, it just like flew by. Now the guests might be like, okay, I'm ready to go home now. But the bride and groom, they better not be thinking that. So on the Seder night, we're the bride and God's the groom. And if we're in a hurry to leave the wedding, we might miss something. So we're supposed to think about how can we infuse it with enthusiasm? And one answer might be is to make each part shorter. So nothing says that we have to belabor each point, but we are supposed to get through the whole thing. And we shouldn't even use the word, like I just said, get through it as if it was, like I just have to get through this simcha. Like we are supposed to enjoy and engage and be on such a high by the time we are done. And that is what the women bring to the Seder. That's what the four cups of wine are about. That is the joy, the enthusiasm, the commitment, the loyalty that we want to serve. And the Jewish women have always been the ones who modeled that. And the men came on the women. So we're the ones who set the tone and the pace and follow. People follow our lead. Now you could say, I did set that pace, but nobody followed me. So yep, I think we've all been in that parade before, but you do the best you can and that's, we can only do what we can do. And that's, that's our role and that is our job. The other thing that the wine teaches us, which is also considered a gift of the women is patience with process. Says that wine, unlike, if, uh, this was kind of funny, not really funny, but kind of funny. When we were going through our things, in our house. So I don't know. I think we came across, somebody came across in my spice cabinet. I don't remember even what spice it was. Obviously not one I use much because on the bottom, it's like it expired in 1986 or whatever, um, like shortly after we moved into our house. So, um, okay. So that's that. If you had a box of matzah and it said, oh, this was from 1986, you'd be like, I don't think we're going to be eating that. But if I served the wine, I said, this wine is from 1986. You're like, oh, wow, that's so nice. That's so generous. Like you're using like your best wine. So the matzah, we want this year's matzah, not even so much last year's matzah. But the wine, it's like the wine is better with the time because it's a process for it to develop that takes patience and attention and an eye on the prize. Like a person who's a vintner has to like keep their eye on the prize of what they're trying to create so they can go through the process. And the process of wine is it goes through a process where it tastes bad before it tastes good. So and that this is the nature of exile and redemption. That the Jewish people went down into Egypt and then came out. This is, it's considered comparable to the stomping on the grapes. And then it goes to kind of a vinegary looks stage before it turns into something that is really precious. So this is what it symbolizes, the ability to recognize that that's how it goes. So what is that? It says that women have this in our spiritual psyche as well. Now, whether you have physically had a child or you have never had a child, says that the woman's psyche is prepared to be able to deal with the fact that if you want to have a baby, you're going to be really super uncomfortable at some point. Some people the entire time, you know, morning sickness, 
stretch marks, heartburn. And I talked to my daughter this evening. I said, how are you feeling? She's like trying to sleep sitting up because of, ugh, you know, feeling fat and swollen and everything is like, why do you have to go through that in order to get a baby? Like a baby is so great. But then it's like, why do you have to go through all that? Like you don't go through that kind of weirdness to get anything else in your life. So why do you have to do it for that? That natural process. The natural process is a weird process. And the weird, uncomfortable, feeling terrible before there's the greatness. It says, this is the nature of exile and redemption. This is the nature of making wine. It says wine is to the world of food what pregnancy is in the world of our physiology and our life as is exile and redemption. So all of it is the same thing. This is like, and this is like the women are able to connect to this and have patience for it. So this patience, which is about wine as well, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. So waiting and enthusiasm sometimes seem paradoxical. I can either be enthusiastic about something that's coming like imminently, or I can wait and be kind of like, okay, I'm waiting. But to be waiting enthusiastically, that's a harder place to be because my enthusiasm makes me impatient and my waiting makes me kind of go down. So which is it? This is the Seder is both, that we are enthusiastically waiting because at the end of the Seder, what do we have? We have the fifth cup of wine that we pour and do not drink because we're waiting for Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet and the ultimate redemption. So like, we're very excited about what we're experiencing now. And we have to wait for the ultimate redemption, which isn't here yet, but it's okay because I'm enthusiastically waiting. It's one of the questions that were asked after 120 years. In addition to were we faithful in our business, how we conducted ourselves in business. The other was like, did you anticipate the redemption and the coming of Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah? Did you, were you enthusiastically patient and waiting and also enthusiastic? So both of those things, we are navigating both of those feelings on Pesach, but not just on Pesach, because we are told every single day, we are supposed to remember the Exodus from Egypt in our redemption. That's one of the six constant mitzvot. One of the six constant remembrances is that we're supposed to remember the exodus from Egypt and the ultimate redemption that is coming. Wine is our symbol of that. And that even though our wine has really been aging for a long time, this redemption, God willing, will be very, very, very sweet. Um, I like only sweet wine. It will be very sweet wine when it is finally uncasked and we're able to drink it. But through the Seder, we talk about, okay, some things are better when it takes time and it has to go through a process that seems really long, but is really worthwhile. So when we have this wine, this is what we are celebrating. And at the same time, we discussed this in our book, Living in the Present Moment, we celebrate each stage. We don't say, I'm not going to celebrate until... I see the final thing. And you know, until it's done, I'm not celebrating. It's like, no, we celebrate every step of the way. So when um, um, Tina and I were writing the book, our book together, we practiced what we were preaching and we celebrated each step, including when we went to Kinko's to print out our first copy to edit. We brought chocolate and liqueur and we sat in the car and we celebrated that. And then we, cel we celebrated every single step because the process is to be celebrated, even though we're navigating, I'm excited about what's happening, but we're not there yet. This combination of excitement and patience, patience and enthusiasm at the same time. So, so we want to do that as well. And maybe something to do at a Seder is to ask people about things that they are waiting for, that they are in the process of. Like, what are you in the process of? process of a degree, process of a job prospect, process, process of, a, of an art um, project, process of working on something on ourselves. I don't know like how much of a therapy session you want to have, but saying, what does it mean to be in process and to have enthusiasm and patience at the same time with it? So, uh, you know, we talk about, um, you know, Lori Palatnik always said that January 1st, 
people join gyms, health clubs. I don't know since COVID if people are doing that, but people used to do that. She said, but you notice that the health clubs never build any more lockers because they know that people will be very enthusiastic on January 1st. And by January 5th, they already hung up their tennis shoes. You know, that they're not coming because the enthusiasm was there, but nobody really wants to engage in the process. So it's that the idea of pregnancy is about process. And we talk about the, the coming of Mashiach, coming of Messiah is called the birth pains of Mashiach, that is talked about as a pregnancy process, that it's going to get uncomfortable, and it's going to cause a lot of stretch marks and indigestion and heartburn and everything else. And we're going to be like, I don't know how much longer I can take this. And then it says, then you know you're getting close to the end. When it's the worst is when it's almost over. And then we will have, God willing, our ultimate redemption. So wine, wisdom, and women are all totally tied together with the, for the Jewish people and at our Seder, and that we have such an incredible opportunity. You know, the merit of the Jewish woman, this enthusiasm, says that there's a concept called the zechut avot, which means the merit of our forefathers. This you can kind of think of as like a, um, a bank account, a spiritual bank account. And it says we call on and we use like when, when we don't really have so much going for ourselves, we say, oh, but I'm related to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I'm using the zechut, the merit of our forefathers. It says, that has the potential, not that it has, it has the potential to be limited. It says, but the merit of the mothers is eternal. The merit of the mothers is eternal because something that is done with enthusiasm and something that is done with commitment and kavana and intention and focus and loyalty is a completely different thing than something that is not. And that's really the spiritual dimension of a physical action. So like we said before, we can be commanded to eat a certain amount of matzah, but I can't tell you what, I can't tell you what you have to be, I can't command you to be enthusiastic about it. So that is a spiritual choice. And that spiritual choice is considered the feminine choice. That's the spirit of the women. And that's what led those goat hair fabrics and the weavings of the women in the Mishkan is like, we don't physically need them, but they have eternal holiness and value. So we're using them anyway. And the women's mirrors, which were totally a physical thing, were imbued with so much holiness and focus and commitment to building the Jewish people. It says, and those will be made into the washing basin for the Kohanim every single day, that they will use that to immerse them. Not, they wash their hands and their feet. They didn't so they go inside of them, that that's what they use before they officiate. Let immerse yourself, wash your hands and feet into the joy, commitment, and enthusiasm of the Jewish women before you officiate. Otherwise, officiating can turn into a very routine, rote, dry, and I'm going to say, I don't mean this really about matzah, because as we said, matzah is very special and holy. We'll probably talk about it next week, but it can be like matzah. It'd be like no taste. It's just like, I'm just going through the motions, but I'm not enjoying it. So this is our goal on the Seder night is to get to this place. And for each of us as Jewish women to embrace this quality that Hashem has given us and that we have a long history of accessing. So if you think about it, you know, I think about growing up, I was fortunate of going to my great grandmothers or to my grandmothers for Pesach Seder, or even I have to say for my mother, and for those of you who knew my mother, people say like, what was your background? Like, how did you grow up? And like, I grew up in Littleton, totally no Jewish people around. My father had the yeshiva education, but my mother had the passion. And in our house, we had the song, you know, Goodbye, chametz. Goodbye, chametz. Goodbye, chametz. We're glad to see you go. Hello, matzah. Hello, matzah. Hello, matzah. We're glad to see you come. Now, obviously, that is not going to win a song contest, but that was the mood of our home. And so Pesach was about the joy and pleasure of going through the process of getting ready for Pesach. 
and there was never even a hint of whining or shrying over getting ready. And it was all a pleasure. That's what I remember. That is what I remember. And it says, and this whining, is what, whining, no pun intended. Yes, we want whining, not whining. <laughs> exactly. Oh, Good one, you Selena. Know, yeah, Rabbi, we want Ka whining, Rabbi not Cass. Whining. Right, Rabbi Cass is like <clears throat> a rabbi who runs um, the No Savigar with Robinson Haller. And I remember saying, asking him when we were in Jerusalem, I was quite young. I said, I don't understand. Everyone's stressing so much about cleaning. I don't get it. And he says, nobody should be stressing. All you're doing is getting rid of edible hummus. Takes yes, a week. And, yes. And I have to say that that is true. That being said, that if our home is like the Mishkan, our home is a sanctuary. Who wants a schmutzy sanctuary for uh, the holiday when we were created as, you know, Hashem's people? It's just like for the honor. In fact, I just learned this actually from, from, um, from our son, Benjamin. He was teaching a class today. And the term, I think I didn't write this down, to clean up your house, to get it ready, is called l'chabed. L'chabed et habayit. L'chabed from the word kavod, which means to honor your home. So it's not like, oh my gosh, you know, will I pass the white glove test? But to honor your home as a holy place. Now, again, it has to be done in a way that suits, you know, if you have kids at home or you're not able or whatever your limitations are, but yes, so I, I disagree with the rabbis. Uh, sorry, I disagree with the rabbis. It's like, it should be clean. It should be because it is a holiday and we are saying something about the centrality of our homes as the ultimate focal point, which is the final piece. The Mishkan, the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, those places were called Beit, Bait. Those places are called homes. Our home is the center of Jewish life. I'm a big fan of synagogues. I'm a big fan of synagogue memberships. But the true center of the Jewish people is the Jewish home. And it doesn't matter how many people are living in it. It can be one person, two, 20, doesn't matter. It is the home, Etta. I was just told one thing. Remember, it is not spring cleaning. And the rabbi left me with that. I mean, make it lovely. Make sure the kitchen and the dining room are lovely. But you don't have to start cleaning the fans. You're not going to eat off of those. You're not going to start painting your whole. You, I mean, you can if you wish. Many people do vacuum there. No, if you've got low apartments. ceiling, <laughs> if you've got low ceiling, I'm telling you, Robertson Heller said, she said, if you have a low ceiling, Dafka, you have to clean your fan. There was a family that sat down for Seder. The fan was on and Cheerios came flying off the fan. Very Hametz Cheerios. So I will <laughs> let each of you explore your personal environment to prepare it to the best of your abilities. So um, it is... Um, with that, that we conclude for today and to think about wine, women, and wisdom, and to realize the tremendous gifts and the tremendous inheritance that we have. Now, I know some women have gotten themselves a little whatever, um, whatever. You do not need an orange on your Seder plate. That is not part of the Seder plate. The place of the women are your four cups of wine. Moshe is not featured in the Seder. Miriam is not featured in the Seder. The Jewish women as a collective, our matriarchs and our patriarchs are featured in the Seder. We're talking about the, the righteous Jewish women. It's in our merit that we had the, that we merited the exodus from Egypt. So you can bring that to the attention of the people at your table. And you can say, this is the first cup is the cup of Sarah. And you can talk about, if you want more information, I'm sure there's lots of places to find out, Chabad.org, other places you can Google what was the gift of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, of what they offered and why they're connected to each of those, um, of each of those. So this is what we're going to focus on. And hopefully you won't look at your wine in the same way again. And I'll say that, that uh, again, we don't want whining, we want whining. And uh, that's what we're going to be able to turn our, our Seder into just such an incredible celebration. We will be meeting, ladies, um, for the next couple of weeks, um, the 
22nd and the 29th, and then we'll be off for Pesach. After that, I'll be going to Florida. I'm not sure what my Wi-Fi is going to be. Um, so um, I'll, we'll keep you posted, but for sure we'll be meeting, God willing, for the next two weeks. In addition, before we close, I just want to say also that the Jewish Experience is starting its fundraising campaign next on this Sunday and Monday. And I would love to have your support on Team HUT. Uh, HUT standing for Help Us Teach Torah, now from, from Colorado and from the land of Israel. And I would really appreciate the support. The theme is together. Together and together we can and what we can do. So you'll hopefully be all hearing from me shortly, but I would love to have your support. Um, I'm extremely competitive, even though I said like, I don't want to be competitive. Okay, yes. If you are related, um, so um, so Judy Flomberg, you need to be on Deb's team since she is your daughter. So that is totally understandable and that's okay. Um, but anybody else who doesn't have other loyalties, I would appreciate your support. And we're so excited with the Jewish experience that's been able to uh, do this past year and what its plans are for the future. Uh, we have a very strong Sunday experience for kids. We have Olami, which is for the young professionals under uh, Rabbi uh, Danny and Sarah Wolf, which is just bringing young people together. Just incredible um, outreach that they're doing and providing young people with such a beautiful connection to their Yiddishkeit. We have our class. We hopefully have trips to Israel. We have Clean Speech Colorado, which has spread now to the rest of the country. And ah, looking forward to Jeannie Abrams, who will be doing a program for the Women's Experience, which has also had a very successful launch um, since we kind of reformatted it. And just very happy about all the things that we can do together. So just like the Jewish people came together and contribute everything for the Mishkan, the building of the Mishkan, we have a long history of successfully making amazing things happening, ma making amazing things happen. So I will leave you with that. You'll see information. I look forward to your support. Together, we can really take everything to the next level in the coming year. How was your Purim? Ellen? It was great. Thank you. Ellen, I've got my hand raised. Yes, Valerie. This is the Torah portion via Hill that Isaac Moseson, the Orthodox Jewish man from Jerusalem, got my Hebrew name from. So this is a yeah. this I'm just so glad I'm so glad I was here today. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. That's Thank great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right, everybody have a wonderful Shabbos, a wonderful Vayakel Kakude, Shabbat Chodesh, the blessing of the new month of Nisan. And it should just be a time of true strength where we take everything that we've gained from the book of Exodus itself and package it up and use it to launch us into the new year, the month of Nisan, where we will start again as a the people who have going following God into the wilderness to receive the Torah. And that will be our next step. So we will talk Amen. again next week about Pesach as well um, to hopefully add something that you can share at your seders or a mindset you can have as you prepare and to take with you after the Passover is has passed over and is long gone. So thank you so much for joining me That's and sure. look forward to seeing you next week. All right, yeah, thank you. So interesting, Alan. Alan. Don't thank get, you. Don't you off, Alan. Not yet, yeah. please. Stay on. Thank I, you, I, Alan. I, thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Ellen. Is Olami for what ages? Just twenties or also thirties? Twenties. I think it's the twenties and and third early thirties as young professionals. And I and think they, is it just they, all? It's it's for Orthodox or any? No, 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 <laughs> not. It's like for everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because right. I pray for singles, so I would yes, like for, to be able to tell them because. We are very short on single groups in the in the city. We we're just talking about it with Karin, and I didn't know that the Jewish Experience had one. So oh yes, a very strong group. Today. Yes, yeah. Olami. Yes, Rabbi Danny and Sarah. They have great programming, fun programming. They do really clever things and things that young people like doing. It's really great. Thank you, Alan. Please that's, stay that's on wonderful. a minute. Thank you. Yes, I will. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, yeah, everybody.
Thank you. Yashar Kuach, thank you. It's wonderful. Okay, thank you.